Alrighty, welcome everyone to Washington Crossing Historic Park and our lecture series for October and our guest speaker, uh, Dr. Matthew Costello. Matthew Costello is the vice president of the David M. Rubenstein National Center for White House History and a senior historian for the White House Historical Association. He completed his PhD and MA in American History at Marquette University and received his BA in History and Political Science from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He previously worked on the George Washington Bibliography Project for the George Washington Papers at the University of Virginia. He has received research fellowships from Marquette University, the Virginia Historical Society, and the United States Capitol Historical Society and the Fred W. Smith National Library at Mount Vernon. He's published articles in the Journal of History and Cultures, Essays in History, The Dome, and White House History. The book he's gonna be speaking to us about today, The Property of a Nation, George Washington's Tomb, Mount Vernon, and the Memory of the First President, was published by the University Press of Kansas in the fall of 2019, and was a finalist for the George Washington Book Prize. And congratulations for that. Uh, welcome, and I'll let you take it from here. Thank you, Kimberly, and, uh, and thank you, uh, to everyone for attending and joining us today. Uh, I was just mentioning to, to Kimberly that we had originally slated this program for April 2020. And my, uh, it's hard to believe that was a year and a half ago. Um, but I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to, to talk about my book, and the research that I did that went into it. And, uh, and without further ado, uh, let's dive in. So the reason that this book is entitled The Property of the Nation is because I, I kept finding this phrase uh, coming up again and again. And uh, you know the sources would, would refer to George Washington as the property of the nation. And often they were talking about either George Washington's tomb, his body, or actual physical pieces of Mount Vernon and Washington's world. And so throughout the 19th century, there were many different attempts to move George Washington's body uh, to be buried elsewhere. Uh, there were efforts to purchase the property. Uh, ultimately, they were successful by the Mount Vernon Ladies Association in the late 1850s. But up to that point in time, there were many different groups of Americans who felt like they had a legitimate claim to George Washington and who he was, who they believed he should be remembered as, and what we see, and we continue to see even to today, how powerful the idea of memory can be. Uh, perhaps it isn't so much what factually happened, but what is remembered versus what is forgotten versus which is celebrated. Uh, these are very different narratives of history. So uh, I'm gonna try to unpack all of these things and, and show you how in the 19th century, these different groups of Americans remembered, commemorated, celebrated Washington, but also uh, how Washington could be used as a tool of unity, but also a tool of division. So our story begins uh, where George Washington's comes to a close. On December 14, 1799, between 10 and 11 o'clock at night, George Washington passed away in his bedroom at Mount Vernon. Three doctors had attended to him uh, since early that morning, uh, James Craig, Gustavus Brown, Elijah Cullen Dick, and they had administered a series of 18th century medical treatments for the condition that Washington found himself in, but he ultimately succumbed to uh, his condition. Uh, the modern science suggests that Washington suffered from acute epiglottitis. Uh, this is where there is a swelling of the larynx and covering of the windpipe, which uh, ultimately leads to, uh, to death, uh, suffocation. And so uh, there's some debate about whether or not it's viral versus bacterial. And then of course, whether or not the medical treatments of Washington's day actually contributed to his death. Uh, you know, for example, by removing so much blood, uh, the approximate estimate is about 80 ounces of blood from George Washington. Uh, did you remove so many white blood cells to fight infection that perhaps uh, you know, that contributed to his death? It's possible, uh, but Washington was also 67 years old. Uh, you know That was a significant age in the 18th century and especially within the Washington family uh, because most Washington men 
tend to die younger than that. Uh, so even George Washington himself thought that he had lived uh, beyond his years. And immediately after Washington dies, there is an outpouring of grief, not only across the country, but also in letter form, going to Mount Vernon, uh, people offering their condolences to Martha Washington. She gets letters from prominent politicians. Uh, she also gets a request from Congress and, and an attached letter to it from John Adams requesting that in the future, when the United States Capitol is finished, that George Washington will be buried there, uh, which she actually agrees to. Uh, she gives her consent. But there are, uh, I would say, more ordinary requests from regular Americans who are, are quite literally asking for a piece of George Washington. Uh, this is a, a locket that's in the Mount Vernon collection, and it features some of George Washington's hair, which may seem odd to us today, but was quite common in the 18th and 19th centuries for family members to snip lockets of hair from the deceased to save as mementos. They would then use these in mourning jewelry, uh, whether it was lockets, rings, um, or necklaces. And, and so we there's a number of letters that come into Mount Vernon, uh, including one from a group of women who are asking for locks of hair. Uh, and they say that their fathers fought with Washington in the revolution. And we know that Martha uh, also allowed this and she actually sent uh, locks of hair to these women in early 1800. So beyond just the immediate grief, the family preparing Washington for burial, and then uh, his funeral was held at Mount Vernon on December 18th. Um, the larger question then becomes, well, how should we commemorate George Washington now that he's gone? Uh, Washington was very particular about his image. He was very careful with his reputation. And I mean, he really saw himself as the guardian of his own legacy. And with him gone, you know, there is a vacuum to decide who should define Washington's legacy, who should pick the best method for remembering one of America's, if not the most, one of the most important founding fathers. And at that time, uh, partisan politics had uh, swelled to a fever pitch. And uh, as you can imagine, the Federalists uh, much more want to align themselves with Washington uh, and use him more sort of as a, a symbol for federalism. Uh, and, and then you have Democratic Republicans who are arguing the opposite. And uh, their argument is that, you know, it wasn't just one man who won the revolution, but it was many men. And so there's this back and forth between these two political groups about the best way to commemorate George Washington. What we're looking at here is one proposal. This was uh, a watercolor painting that was done by Benjamin Henry Latrobe, the, the famous uh, English architect. And uh, at one point there, were, there was an idea to actually create a pyramid, a pyramidal mausoleum for George Washington's remains in the federal city. And as you can imagine, the Democratic Republicans uh, saw, th saw this as monarchical. They saw this as uh, treating Washington as if he was a pharaoh. And, uh, and so this question of hero worship in America and whether or not that hero worship revolves around bodily remains and monuments and grandiose tombs, uh, it, it's, it takes a different twist uh, because you know, we are not like uh, Great Britain, we are not like France, uh, they do have these larger national places of repose. Uh, we really don't have that. There's Congressional Cemetery, but we really don't have that uh, until Arlington National Cemetery uh, after the Civil War. So uh, Americans are debating whether or not George Washington or anyone uh, should be commemorated this way and whether or not that flies in the face of what the revolutionary ethos really was. Now, at that same time, uh, you had Congress that had petitioned for George Washington's body and Martha had said, sure, but keep in mind, the Capitol was not only not finished, it gets burned in 1814. Uh, so that delays finishing it even longer. And there was concern uh, with the burning that Washington's bodily remains would not be safe at the future Capitol uh, whenever it was constructed. So the state of Virginia actually petitions uh, George Washington's nephew, uh, Supreme Court Associate Justice Bushrod Washington, uh, to relinquish his uncle's body and they would reinter it underneath a monument in Richmond, which is the capital of Virginia at the time. And Bushrod Washington declines this application. So now we, we have the federal government has asked for it and Martha said, okay. Uh, and then we have the state of Virginia petitioning for it and they are denied. Well, this never really gets resolved because Bushrod Washington passes away in 1829 and then the property reverts to John Augustine Washington Jr. 
and he is Bushrod Washington's nephew, so it keeps passing along the nephews. And uh, in 1830, 1831, that is when the new tomb is constructed at Mount Vernon. Now this is, I think, 18, circa 1834. It looks quite a bit different than the new tomb you may have seen at Mount Vernon. That's because this is really uh, the original structure. It's sort of the, the back inner vault uh, that you've seen if you look into the enclosure. Only later in the 1830s was it encased in brick. Uh, we have the receipts for that work. And then uh, that inner enclosure where George and Martha's uh, sarcophagi rests today, that enclosure was added later uh, in the late 1830s. So this is what people would have seen when they came to Mount Vernon. They, they described Washington being the property of the nation, uh, but then they were also very critical. Of some, some were very critical of such a humble place of repose for arguably the greatest American. Uh, and they were not shy about voicing their displeasure. Uh, and people took up all different kinds of causes. They wanted to raise money to purchase it or to try to convince the Washington family to do something bigger and better. Now, the Washington family, uh, even within that uh, group of people, uh, there was not agreement about where George Washington should be buried or remain buried. For example, uh, the decision was really left to this man, John Augustine Washington III. Uh, this was Junior's son. Um, so this, this we have a passing within one family. But John Augustine Washington III was the last private owner of Mount Vernon. He's the one who sells to the Mount Vernon Ladies Association uh, in 1858, and they take possession of it in 1860. And, uh, and he is at also the first Washington to really decide to embrace this idea of historical tourism. The owners of Mount Vernon prior to that tended to resist having people on the property. Uh, in fact, Bushrod Washington, uh, he, he published notices uh, around the boundaries of the property saying that he would prosecute trespassers. Uh, he threatens to sue steamboat captains in court uh, because the steamboats are bringing people down and dropping them off at, at Mount Vernon, very similar to the spirit of Mount Vernon today. And, uh, and John Augustine Washington III decides that there's really no reason to resist it at this point. These people are going to keep coming. So why not embrace it and, and try to make some profit from it? One of the projects he does is he has this uh, wooden walkway built that goes from down by the river uh, where the steamboats would actually drop people off at the wharf. And this walkway goes up to the new tomb. Now you have to keep you have to keep in mind in the 19th century that uh, you know the primary attraction at Mount Vernon was not the house. You need that that pack against the wall. No, nah, I don't need that. So the primary attraction at Mount Vernon in the 19th century was not the house. Uh, you know. Today, when we, people go to Mount Vernon, obviously people go inside, they wanna see the house, uh, they wanna see where George Washington lived and where he died. And there are a number of other things also to see on the estate, but in the 19th century, uh, there was still people living in the house. Washington's family was still living in the house. And really, unless you had a letter of introduction to get inside or the Washington family knew you, chances are you probably weren't going to be admitted to have an audience with any of the Washington family members. So that left a lot of these people just sort of milling around and wandering the grounds. And so what was a place that they could visit? Well, it was the tomb. And the tomb became the primary attraction uh, as displayed by this uh, 19th century handbill. And this was an advertisement for people to come visit uh, Mount Vernon, but it's Mount Vernon, the tomb of Washington. Uh, and it's based on this handbill, you don't even know that there's a house there to visit. <laughs> you know, it's. And you can see the wooden walkway right there that goes up to the tomb, really taking people directly from the boat uh, to that site of repose. At the same time, you had a, a number of, of different groups of people who were manufacturing and producing different types of Washington trinkets and mementos so that people could purchase these either on site or if they weren't able to get to Mount Vernon in person, they could purchase these things at a, uh, at a factory in Washington, DC. You can see on this medallion, there is a, a name attributed there, J, J. Crutchett Mount Vernon Factory. That's James Crutchett. And, uh, and he entered into a contract with John Augustine Washington III to harvest uh, timber from Mount Vernon, the estate, transport it to Washington, DC to his factory. And then he made uh, a number of Mount Vernon 
bowls, coins, medallions out of Mount Vernon wood so that people could literally own a piece of George Washington's world. And of course you would get a certificate of authenticity with it uh, because otherwise nobody would believe you. <laughs> and so uh, you, would, you were given this, the Mount Vernon gem, and, uh, and you have these written statements, uh, um, you know, essentially un, kind of like under oath, right? Uh, from John A. Washington. Uh, this is to certify that Mr. James Crutcher of the city of Washington, District of Columbia, purchased from me a large amount of timber, trees, et cetera, standing on my estate at Mount Vernon in Virginia. A portion of this timber was growing upon the same hill in which the mansion and tomb at Mount Vernon stand and the whole of it on the original Mount Vernon estate. Which is really interesting because then when I went through John Augustine Washington's records and I was able to map out exactly where on the estate this stuff came from, he is, he is being truthful. A portion did come from that part of the state, but it was a very small amount. Uh, a lot of the wood actually came from other parts of the estate. But the key here is for anybody who was purchasing this product or any type of product that was made by Crutchet was that the belief that it came from the same hill on which the mansion and tomb at Mount Vernon, that there was some sort of imbued power that came from having something that grew from the same spot where George Washington was buried. So I've, I've talked a little bit about the politics of moving George Washington's body, how it seems as though not only did political parties disagree about hero worship, but then we also have the dynamic of the federal government saying that they would like to move George Washington's body. And they try again in 1832, in fact, uh, but Washington's family declines it again. Uh, that, of course, is the 100th anniversary of George Washington's birth. So that's why they try it. Uh, but then we have the state of Virginia that tries uh, not only in uh, 1815 uh, after the burning of the Capitol, uh, but then later in the 1850s, uh, there's sort of back and forth between the federal government and the state of Virginia trying to work with John Augustine Washington III to purchase the property so that it comes under the ownership of one of those uh, two state and federal entities. So then I, I started to wonder, well, if the Washington family is not really interested in interacting with people, uh, you really needed a letter of introduction to meet one of them or go inside the house. Who is actually having these conversations? Because these newspapers talk about steamboats of hundreds of people coming to Mount Vernon and you have people coming on in carriages and omnibuses on horseback. So it seems like there's always gotta be people milling around. So I was wondering, well, well then if they're just sort of wandering around, who are they talking to? What are they seeing? Obviously the tomb is, is a big part of that. But what I found in my research is that quite often they were speaking to the people working on the estate. And this could have been uh, overseers, it could have been gardeners, it could have been uh, farm managers, but it also could have been enslaved people. And so um, that seems to be the, the time where visitors really take note because these enslaved workers also sort of play on the legends of George Washington. Sometimes uh, they can be very, uh, they're very proactive and, and quite, uh, you know, literally weaving themselves into the story where they talk about not only did they know Washington personally, uh, but they there's there's one man in particular who says he remembers wrestling with Washington and he pinned him to the ground. Uh, there's a, there's another one who talks about they remember when George Washington came back from the revolution. Now, my research suggests that, you know, some of these stories are, are probably oral tradition and passed down. Uh, in fact, as was common with the case with changing ownership of a plantation, uh, some of these enslaved people were Bushrod Washingtons or John Augustine Washington Jr. Uh, so there weren't many of George Washington's own enslaved people to stay there because uh, I'm sure as many of you know, George Washington freed the people he owned outright in his will, 123 people. Uh, and those people were freed upon Martha's death, but she freed them early. Uh, so. These stories are passed on and it's really interesting to see how African-Americans are using uh, sort of like the Mason Lock Weems type stories and, and other things they can point together to talk to people about George Washington. I mean, they really are sort of the first interpreters of the grounds. And, uh, and for some of them, especially the ones that are really old, uh, this helps them sell the story. You know, uh, quite, 
I found quite a few instances where visitors, white visitors are coming and they talk about meeting an old slave or an aged enslaved storyteller. And this person's able to talk about Washington in the French and Indian War and the revolution and the presidency. And so it, it's really fascinating to see how uh, a lot of them use this, this idea of the, being the last slave of George Washington. They use it as, as a way to bring themselves uh, status, uh, to, to bring themselves uh, notoriety, but also uh, visitors are tipping uh, enslaved people. They're also purchasing things from them. For example, uh, this is one such image. This is a, the cover of a score of music. And this is, of course, the Washington's Tomb Ballad. And you can see uh, by the tomb, we have a visiting uh, white tourist family. And then there's a African-American man to the left and a series of walking sticks next to him. And I found that quite a bit in my research as well, that people were purchasing uh, walking sticks, uh, bouquets of flowers, fruit uh, from enslaved workers on the estate. Again, kind of keeping in mind that people wanted a physical reminder of their trip and also something that came from George Washington's estate and his world. Here's a good photograph from right around the eve of the Civil War. You can see again, uh, this man with what looks like a, a young African-American boy peering into the enclosure. Um, you know, since they're the only two there, uh, I suspect that perhaps that boy was uh, also giving a tour that day, probably showing them around. And I did find other instances where children uh, were acting as tour guides on the estate as well. And here you can see he's, uh, if you look at the shadow, he's holding up a walking stick. Uh, so he, I guess he probably didn't pay for that. He just, maybe he grabbed it out of that pile of brush uh, that's sitting next to one of the obelisks. Uh, this picture is actually from a little bit later. This is uh, a man named Jim Mitchell. He was enslaved at Mount Vernon and, uh, and then after the Civil War came back, worked as a freeman. And uh, this picture is from the eight, sometime in the 1870s. But you can see, again, uh, the, the walking sticks behind him. And, and so that is a tradition. If you go to Mount Vernon today in the gift shop, there are a number of things you can purchase that are made out of wood from the estate or from a tree that fell on the estate. And so uh, that is not a recent phenomenon that dates all the way back uh, to the first half of the 19th century. So I mentioned earlier that not even within Washington's family was there a consensus about how Washington should be remembered or even where he should be buried. And John Augustine Washington III and uh, his father and then Bushrod Washington all believed that George Washington should stay buried at Mount Vernon. But uh, this gentleman, George Washington Park Custis, disagreed. Uh, he, he was the grandson of uh, Martha Washington. Uh, George had served as a sort of a surrogate father figure to him. But, uh, you know, I think even George Washington would admit it wasn't with much success. Um, they called him Wash or Washtub. Uh, that he, he uh, you know, he really sort of marched to his own beat. Uh, he didn't see the value in, in same, some of the same things as George Washington. Uh, you know, Washington really wanted him to have a college education. It was something that he never had. He thought that that would be a great way for him to really buckle down, uh, to get serious about his studies, to meet important and perhaps in the future influential people, uh, to make those connections and those relationships. And uh, Wash did not see it that way. Uh, I think he knew that uh, with the death of his, his father and then um, you know, with, with Martha as well, uh, that there was quite a bit of inheritance coming to him. So I don't think he, he necessarily saw the same merits as, uh, as his step-grandfather did. So this was something that George Washington, uh, you know, even George Washington struggled uh, with teenage angst. And uh, I talk about that in the book uh, as well. But after George Washington passed away, George Washington Park Custis, you know, one of his hobbies was, uh, was writing poetry, writing plays, uh, writing short stories. And, uh, and in giving speeches, in particular speeches about his step-grandfather, George Washington. And so in a way, he sort of became the, the Washington family spokesperson, even though he had no claim to Mount Vernon or uh, to the tomb or to the deceased family members, he really became the one who was talking the most about the Washington family and talking the most about George Washington. And uh, when we get to the 1850s, when he starts publishing his recollections, he puts out the idea that Martha Washington on her deathbed had told him 
to make sure that her and George are removed from Mount Vernon and buried in the Capitol. So just when we thought that perhaps this issue had been laid to rest, pun intended, uh, you know, George Washington Park Custis uh, dredges it back up. And, uh, and part of it is even within Washington's family, within the approaching Civil War, there's a divide uh, amongst that household. George Washington Park Custis, even though he's a Virginian, he's a slaveholder, uh, does appear to be more nationalist and, uh, and, and doesn't seem to subscribe uh, to some of the ideas that later become secession and then become the Confederacy. So uh, that's something else to keep in mind that even within Washington's family, getting up to the eve of the Civil War, there's still disagreement about how we should talk about George Washington, where he should be buried. And, uh, and that also juxtaposes with how artists and illustrators are portraying the tomb at the same time, because even though more and more Americans are coming to Mount Vernon, they're visiting the tomb, they're paying their respects, most Americans are not gonna have the opportunity to go to Mount Vernon. You know, it, it's still difficult to get there. Uh, unless you are traveling to Washington DC for something else and you make that trip, that might happen. But for a lot of Americans, and as the country continues to expand westward, you know, they're not going to get to that side of the country, probably in their lifetime. And so one way that a lot of people get to interact with the tomb is through visuals. And so whether it is a, an illustration, uh, this one is bought, engraved uh, by Joshua Hill and it's printed by John Shaw, or, uh, you know, whether it's a, a print, this is William Henry Brooke and uh, Alexander Dix rendering. Uh, I, I, the one thing that I do try to point out to people is that you kind of, you keep seeing the same thing, that the tomb is the focal point. So even in these images where you have a larger panorama of the area, the estate, the home, again, this sort of reaffirms what I said earlier, the primary attraction on site is not the mansion house. The mansion house is a private home. The primary attraction on site is the new tomb. Here is a painting by uh, William uh, Matthew Pryor. So this is, again, it just goes to show you that the same pattern is happening, not just in engravings and in illustrations, uh, but, uh, but also uh, painted works as well. So what about the visitors themselves? How did, they, how did they view what they were doing? Like, was this more like a trip uh, or was it more like a pilgrimage? In fact, quite a few visitors use this very religious laden language to talk about who they were, why they were there, and the things they took. So frequently I came across the phrases, people referring to themselves as pilgrims, or pilgrims are stripping trees of their leaves, or stripping trees of their bows, or people saying that they went to Mount Vernon on a pilgrimage, or that they took, for example, a relic, such as a lemon, uh, a lemon leaf, a lemon tree leaf. And so in, in the book, I say that this clearly denotes that, okay, this probably isn't the same as a visiting a holy site in a Judeo-Christian sense. However, this does tell us that in the 19th century, Americans felt that there was something really personal and significant and meaningful about going to Mount Vernon because this is, this is the type of language that they used to describe these things. Uh, you know, they, they don't have things like, they, they don't really use words like artifact. Uh, you know, they, they don't really use words necessarily like mementos, uh, at least not in the context of visiting Mount Vernon. They, they don't seem to call these types of things trinkets, mementos, they're relics. Uh, and so that tells us a little bit more about how significant Washington was to this growing group of people who were willing to travel long distances, uh, whether it was by boat, uh, by horse, by carriage, to pay their respects at Washington's tomb. Uh, so this is a, I mentioned it, it is a lemon leaf uh, taken from a tree in the greenhouse at Mount Vernon in February, 1820. Uh, but again, like, you know, whether or not that lemon tree even existed when George Washington was alive, we don't know. Um, but the fact that it was in George Washington's greenhouse gave it sort of these pseudo sacred properties. And so it was worth taking. Now, if you keep doing this repeatedly over time, you all are probably reaching the same conclusion. Well, if you keep having people who are coming to this place and they keep taking things, isn't that gonna damage the place? Yes, uh, that, that's a big reason why Mount Vernon is in pretty bad shape in the 1850s. It's vi visitor vandalism. A lot of people like to carve their initials into things. They like to take things. Uh, 
Um, they, they like to break things off. Uh, and, and also a big part of it is just the Washington family has been unable to keep up uh, with the property and, and making sure that these things uh, are continue to be repaired and, uh, and replaced. And so it, it's sort of a combination of these things that it's part of the reason why Mount Vernon is such a uh, poor condition by the time John Augustine Washington III sells the ladies uh, in the late 1850s. One of the most sought, off, uh, sought after pieces uh, from the Mount Vernon estate were pieces that either were physical pieces of George Washington's coffin or anything that was adjacent to touching on uh, or near the tomb. That seems to be the reoccurring thing that people would go to the tomb, they would gather things like stones and pebbles on the ground, they would take sprigs off the front of the tomb, they would take leaves and, and, uh, and sometimes entire tree branches to make a cane. Uh, and this is one such example. Uh, this is a piece of the coffin in which George Washington was buried. Uh, so there are some accounts where people go into the old tomb, the one that's closer to the Potomac River, and they go inside and even though there's nobody buried in there anymore, they're looking on the ground for bits and pieces of wood. Now keep in mind, uh, there were uh, about 20 other family members <laughs> buried in there. So whether or not that is a piece of George Washington's coffin, uh, I, I, we can't be sure, but it just goes to show you that it, it was this power of belief that people really believed that this was a piece of the coffin and they wanted to possess a piece of it uh, to take it home with them. Now the actual sarcophagus that Washington is, is in today uh, there's sort of an unusual story behind that as well. So earlier I mentioned the federal government tries to move Washington's body in 1832. This is declined. A big part of that is because the Washington family had just built a new tomb. In fact, in Washington's will, he requests that a new tomb is built and he even marks out where he wants it to be placed near the vineyard enclosure, uh, which is roughly where it is today. And, uh, and they don't do this for three decades. Uh, it's not until 1830, 1831, that a new tomb is constructed. And, and that was the earlier image that I showed you of that space. In 1835, it is encased in brick uh, by a, a stonemason named William Yeaton. And then after that, uh, there's two men who actually write an offer to construct a marble sarcophagus for George Washington. One is William Strickland. He's the one who designs uh, the, the eagle and shield uh, look on the top of the sarcophagus. And then the man who actually produces it as a marble mason from Philadelphia named John Struthers. And according to William Strickland's account, uh, when they produced these things, they, they brought them down. Lawrence Lewis was the last surviving executor of George Washington's estate. And, uh, and they had corresponded with Lewis, they had offered to do this. And so Lewis sent them dimensions that they needed so they could produce it. And when they got down to Mount Vernon, uh, they were a bit mortified to find out that the sarcophagus would not fit through that doorway. Uh, you, you've probably seen it before. It's that small doorway in the back of the uh, in the back of the enclosure. Uh, the sarcophagus was not going to fit through it, and so uh, they decided then to add this archway over the top, and that George and Martha would have their marble sarcophagi in that enclosure. Uh, so this really affords it that anytime the public comes and visits, they're able to actually get within you know, a pretty close reach of, of George and Martha and to see their final resting place as opposed to them being in the interior chamber. Now, uh, Strickland and Struthers make the argument that uh, you know, they, don't, they don't want their work to be destroyed because of the moisture and, uh, and that they don't want these things to decay. And, uh, and, and, but in fact, it probably has more to do with it won't quite fit through the doorway. Uh, and because of that, uh, you know, George Washington remains in the enclosure today, uh, ever since he was removed and resealed in that in 1837. So the last piece of this story is really how do we get to where we are today, where people are still visiting Mount Vernon, they're still visiting the tomb, they're still paying their respects. But really, this is only possible because of a group of women who came together and were able to raise the necessary funds to purchase Mount Vernon. As I mentioned earlier, it seemed the only time that the federal government and the state of Virginia were interested in Mount Vernon uh, seemed like when they thought that the other one was interested. Uh, and, and then they went back and forth. And ultimately, the, these things never come to fruition. Uh, 
Part of it is because of the cost. Part of it is because John Augustine Washington III has pretty steep terms. And so this opens the door for a private organization of people to step forward with the money and purchase Mount Vernon. And it is this group of women, which uh, John Augustine Washington, he is reluctant to sell to them. He doesn't want to sell to a private entity. He thinks that he really needs to sell to either the federal government or uh, the state of Virginia to really sort of keep his reputation intact. But eventually he, he comes to the conclusion that neither one of those entities is going to be able to put up the kind of money that he wants and, uh, and, and not abide by his terms. And so uh, he finally agrees to sell to this woman and Pamela Cunningham and, uh, and her uh, group of regents. And Anne Pamela, Anne Pamela Cunningham, uh, it's very important to note that she comes from South Carolina. Uh, she is the one that really is the driving force behind this. But uh, you know, when she originally put out the call to help save Mount Vernon, she really appealed more to Southern women. And only later when she started receiving correspondence from women from other places, including the North, that she became more receptive to making this more of a national organization that uh, instead of just relying on the women of the South uh, and to do what, do what was right and rely on their Southern uh, you know, code of virtue and honor and that a woman is supposed to take care of the house and who better to take care of Washington's house than the women of the South, uh, she also finds that these women of the North have well-connected friends and uh, have access to capital and there is money to be raised. And so even though many of the Southern women that she's working with disagree with the decision, you know, uh, we have to acknowledge that Anne Pamela Cunningham uh, sees that, that there's a lot more upside to having a national organization and, uh, and, and to be able to raise the necessary money to save Mount Vernon. And so she makes that decision. And, uh, and we have, as a result, the Mount Vernon Ladies Association of the Union. Uh, that was the full title uh, when they were chartered by the state of Virginia. They acquired the property from John Augustine Washington in 1860. And, uh, and as it turns out, John Augustine Washington III, he keeps quite a bit of the, the land around Mount Vernon. He only sells uh, the mansion, the tomb, uh, and I think he sells, I think it's about 150 acres. So, I mean, it's actually a relatively small amount uh, compared to Washington's original estate, which was more than 8,000 acres. So he actually keeps quite a bit of the land and uh, he goes off to fight for the Confederacy. So there is concern that perhaps as the war unfolds that the federal government or the Union Army might try to occupy and confiscate Mount Vernon. And so the ladies have to maintain a, a a policy of neutrality. And, and so they tell soldiers that they're welcome to visit Mount Vernon, but they're asked to lay their arms down. Uh, this is not supposed to be a place for fighting, but a place of reflection, uh, a place of, of honoring George Washington. You can see from this, uh, this the New York Illust Illustrated News clipping that not everybody followed that <laughs> because quite a bit of these men are walking around with their, uh, with their muskets. But uh, it's interesting because if you go to Mount Vernon today and you look at the front of the new tomb, you can see people have carved their initials into it. And sometimes you'll even see they put what Civil War regiment they were part of. And so this process continues, uh, even in the time of war, where people, in this case soldiers, are literally leaving their mark on George Washington, claiming him, uh, and I would argue in a way, making the case that the Union is claiming George Washington. We're fighting for the union, we're fighting for what Washington believed in. Uh, and it's interesting because on the other side, the Confederacy does something very similar. Uh, they put Washington on the Confederate seal. Uh, Jefferson Davis is sworn into office in front of a new statue of George Washington. Uh, he's sworn in on February 22nd. So, I mean, the, the symbolism is there uh, on both sides uh, because Washington is such an important figure, a unifying figure but at the same time, a divisive figure uh, because you have one side claiming him to be all these other things, a federalist, a constitutionalist, president, a general. And then you have another side that says he was a, uh, he was a rebel general. He was a revolutionary. He was a Southerner. He was a Virginian. Uh, so again, it just goes to show you that Washington has this malleability about him uh, and he can be used by both sides. And uh, th this last picture I have is... Uh, Again, sort of keeping up with this idea of neutrality, the home was pretty much looked after by two people. Uh, the gentleman on the right, Upton Herbert, who was a Virginian, 
but he was actually a neighbor of John Augusta Washington III's. He did not go off to fight in the uh, in the war, but you know people had accused him or suspected him of being uh, you know sympathetic to the Confederate cause. And then there's a woman named Sarah Tracy who is from New York, and she is one of the secretaries for uh, Anne Pamela Cunningham, who gets stuck in South Carolina when the war starts, and she's unable to return to Mount Vernon until the war is over. Uh, so the pairing of a northern woman and a southern man, again. Uh, really trying to represent that Mount Vernon remains neutral ground and that both sides need to respect that. And the final slide I want to end on is this one. And uh, this is an, uh, an, a picture of Washington's new tomb. I think this is around the turn of the 20th century, uh, maybe like the 1890s. And, uh, and the reason I finished with this one is because I really like not only all the decoration on the tomb, but I, I do like these boxwood words are Washington. And uh, it, that seems to be sort of the, the case, you know, even when people were talking about Washington as the property of the nation, that uh, Washington was thought of as ours. Uh, it was just a question of who is our, you know, is, is, is our mean Virginians are saying he's our Washington? Is it American saying he's our Washington? Uh, is it uh, Federalists saying he's our Washington? And so even though today I think Washington can, you know, I, I think there's quite a bit of consensus about Washington. He can be seen as a, a unifying figure. Uh, there are still times where even the most, uh, you know, I think the, the most important, most, you know, indispensable figure uh, can be used uh, for different political purposes, different social agendas. And so um, as I close, you know, one thing I, and I didn't put this in the book, so that's why I like to say it. And I like to say it in my talks because it's one of those things that you think of after the fact. Um, how would Washington want to be remembered? Well, I do think if he saw the Washington Monument in Washington, DC, he might be impressed, uh, you know, with the, the size and the design, um, but he also might be sort of flabbergasted uh, that such a large structure uh, was put up for him. And to get a better sense of how he would have wanted to be remembered, Washington does note uh, towards the end of his life that there's still one building he wants to build on the estate, and that is a building to house his papers. Uh, and that is really sort of the first, uh, what we believe is sort of the first embryonic idea of a presidential library uh, was that Washington really wanted to build something like that, that people could use. Now, we don't have the Fred W. Smith Library for quite a while. Um, but the other place to look at how Washington wanted to be remembered is his final will and testament. And in it, uh, Washington describes himself as a citizen of the United States and former president of, which I find really fascinating. Because if you look at others, if you look at people like John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, Alexander Hamilton, if you look in their wills, how they identify themselves is purely geographic. Uh, they, they say, I, uh, John Adams, uh, Braintree, Massachusetts. I, Thomas Jefferson of Abemarle County. I, Alexander Hamilton of New York. I, James Madison of Orange County, Virginia. They all specify based on, you know, essentially where they live or where their estates are or where their property is. But the fact that Washington wrote that and he created that new will uh, essentially the summer, I think the summer before he died, he, he was working on a new will. He clearly had given more thought about his death, his legacy, how he, he would be remembered, and what, if any, input he could have in that. And, uh, and I think that's, that, to me, suggests that Washington was telling us how he wanted to be remembered when he says, I, George Washington, a citizen of the United States and former president of uh, he wanted to be remembered as a citizen of the United States. He wanted to be remembered as an American. So uh, to think, you know, the, all these different groups are fighting over, well, Washington was a Southerner. Washington was a Virginian. Washington was a Federalist. Washington was a, you know, his will is pretty clear. He wants to be remembered as an American, first and foremost. And so uh, I, I tell people to keep that in mind. You know, anytime you hear about, uh, you know, whether it's journalists or commentators or historians talking about, Washington and his legacy and how he would want to be remembered. Uh, I think these words that he put in his will uh, tell us how he wanted to be remembered. 
Um, you, you just have to read them carefully and, and you have to understand that Washington was, was rethinking all of these things toward the end of his life. And so with that, uh, thank you for your time. I appreciate uh, everybody joining us and uh, I would be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful talk that we, it's a long time coming, <laughs> but it was worth the wait. So thank you for that. Uh, we have, again, if you have any questions, please put them in, in the chat to everyone, but we do have one already. Uh, were there any descriptions of the remains at the time that um, the Washingtons were resealed in the sarcophagi in the 1830s? Yeah, so there, there are actually, uh, at different times, there are descriptions related to George Washington's body. And then there are also sort of like these pseudo rumors where uh, people, people later claim to have seen George Washington's body or they claim to have seen it. And uh, it can be very elaborate. Like for example, there's one man who says that Washington appeared to be floating in some type of liquid and I mean, there's not really any historical evidence to support that uh, and or that they would have filled his coffin with alcohol or some type of preservative. Um, the account by Strickland probably gives the best description uh, when they move him. And uh, based on that, I think he talks about um, the skull. He talks about dried flesh. Uh, but, you know, it's it's an outdoor tomb in Virginia. So the idea that maybe Washington hadn't had any type of decomposition. That's not true. Uh, it seems like based on Strickland's account, it, it's what you would have expected opening a tomb you know, 30 years later. Um, there is, uh, there's another instance where a man, uh, it's actually in his obituary, he dies in 1912. And he claims that he was present there as a young boy in 1837. And he says that George Washington was still perfectly preserved and uh, he had just a little dark spot on his cheek. Um, but the man also got the year wrong that they moved George Washington's body. So again, it just kind of goes to show you that you have to look at the whole body of evidence uh, before you consider whether or not these stories have any plausibility or it's just sort of people jumping onto this because they wanna be, they wanna weave themselves into the story. All right, another question. Uh, how do you think the Mount Vernon legacy for America will continue? And are the ladies still in charge? The ladies are still in charge. Uh, Mount Vernon continues to be privately owned. And, uh, and as far as the, the Mount Vernon legacy for America will continue, I mean, you know, uh, James Thomas Flexner wrote a series of biographies. He also wrote, you know, the one volume still, I think, considered by many historians to be one of the best one volume texts about George Washington called The Indispensable Man. And I like to say that Washington, uh, he was indispensable, but he was also, he's also unavoidable. Uh, it's, even if you try to talk about early American history, you try to talk about the constitution, you try to talk about the revolution, try to talk about the presidency. He's just always kind of, he, he's in the way. Uh, you know, you, you can't avoid Washington. So I, I think he is always going to be part of that, the core of the narrative of the founding of the country, the creation of the country, and then also, um, you know, sort of the envisioning for that country. Washington is vital to that as well. And so I think with Mount Vernon, um, you know, it's pretty remarkable. They, they've still, even though with the COVID-19 pandemic, you know, they, they had to close for quite a while, um, you know, it still continues to be one of the most well-visited uh, presidential sites in the country. And so, you know, I think moving forward, the, the ladies are going to continue to think about, you know, how, what does Washington mean to this generation? Uh, what does he, what does he mean? What are we learning about Washington now that changes what we thought we knew about Washington? Because they're doing all kinds of great research, archaeology, uh, renovation work. Um, in fact, I was, I was there the other day and uh, they're completely redoing the north side, which is the exterior of the new room. So they're continuing to learn new things at Mount Vernon and they're gonna, it's going to continue to shape how we view Washington, how we view his legacy. And, uh, and the ladies have been integral to that, not only purchasing the property, saving it, uh, but also these projects that continue.
have there been any uh, DNA testing or forensic testing of the Washington remains? That's a great question. Uh, as far as I know, there hasn't been. Um, I know that that's been a question that's come up before because people are often interested in, uh, there's a story of a formerly enslaved man named West Ford. And uh, I talk a little bit about West Ford in the book as well, so you can read more about him. But uh, you know, based on his upbringing, it seems like uh, West Ford had a very real connection to the Washington family. So whether it was a Washington family member who fathered West Ford with one of the enslaved women, uh, there's one version that George Washington is the father, uh, but I think most historians have said that seems unlikely because Washington didn't have children. Uh, there's there's some evidence perhaps that he couldn't have children. Um, so, I mean, it just goes to show you that even though we're still learning things, there's a lot that we don't know. And so with the DNA testing, uh, the only way that would, uh, even though I'm a historian, um, and so if I'm wrong, maybe somebody can correct me in the chat, but uh, the only way that that would really work is, is if you had, if George Washington had some type of male descendant uh, that you could continue to compare the DNA down the line. Um, so I, I think it would be particularly difficult and I don't think that's been something that the Ladies Association has actively pursued or done. Did Benson Lossing's book on Mount Vernon uh, play any significant role in popularizing the site as a tourist destination? It did. Uh, Benson Lossing's publication, and I talk a little bit more about it in the book, um, that particular publication, but then also uh, there's a slew of these different types of travel guides. Uh, think of it as sort of the forerunners to like Frommers, where people are producing these small booklets about the Washington family, uh, the genealogy, the descendants, the home itself, the history. So you have all these different materials that people have access to. And it does, it, it does draw more people to Mount Vernon. Uh, I do think it, it's a number of things that go with that. It's Washington is still remains probably the most significant historical figure by the 1850s. Um, it's the proximity to Washington, D.C. that makes it e easier to visit. Uh, it's the abundance of steamboats, which I don't think I mentioned it, but John Augustine Washington III actually enters into a contract with a steamboat company to bring people down. And uh, part of the deal is he gets a cut of the ticket sales. So um, it was a number of different things contributing to more and more people visiting Mount Vernon in the 1850s. The final question is one that uh, I will pose to you. You mentioned that there had been some um, graffiti by way of people carving their name in um, mm -hmm. soldiers during the Civil War. And then the fact that, was it in the 1920s or so that the area around the tomb was rebuilt? Were those, um, was that graffiti preserved within it or was it um, discarded and just considered to be graffiti? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, uh, if, you, if you go to Mount Vernon today, in fact, uh, Mount Vernon has an excellent, um, Mount Vernon has an excellent uh, 360 imaging tour. Uh, so you can actually do this online from home as well, but you can zoom in close enough that you can look at the front face of the tomb. And, uh, and a lot of the graffiti that I would say dates, I mean, there is, you can tell some of the stuff is from the Civil War because it mentions regiments, but there's also graffiti from later. Uh, so people were continuing to carve their names into things um, and so with that, uh, you can still see some of this graffiti today. Uh, you don't see as much of it on the old tomb, um, but I know from a number of the different visitor accounts, they talk about uh, seeing the wood door of the old tomb and it was carved with people's names and initials and you don't see that anymore. So I would imagine it was, you know, that door has been replaced uh, over time. So there is a balance that has to be had between replacing things that look like they've been, you know, desecrated, defaced, uh, but then also looking at that graffiti in a different way, that this is this is ordinary people coming to Mount Vernon and leaving their mark on Washington. And somebody here wants to let you know uh, how much they appreciate your research and how mm -hmm. much they've enjoyed this talk. And I will second that comment. Uh, it's been wonderful. And I wanna thank you for joining us uh, to everyone of our participants. I want to thank you for
signing up and, and coming to visit us virtually. I wanna let you know that we've got two more, um, two more lectures in our series for this year. On November 7th, there'll be a lecture um, that I will be giving on the Quaker conundrum in revolutionary Pennsylvania. And on December 5th, uh, this one will be at seven o'clock at night. Hopefully, hopefully these will both be in person. Uh, our annual lecture on who is here, where I highlight a few different people who participated in the crossing. And with that, again, I thank all of you for joining us. And Matthew, I thank you for your patience with our needing to postpone as many times as we did. <laughs> and thank you for, uh, for speaking with us today. It was a pleasure to be with you all. Thank you so much. And uh, I look forward to getting back up there in person sometime in the near future. But I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of their Sunday and uh, Godspeed. Thank you.